Welcome. Thank you all for being here this evening. The last time I introduced a speaker, a friend of mine afterwards said, I knew you were nervous because you read your own name. So, so I'm, I'm purposely looking out at the moment, not down at my piece of paper. Um, I'm Alex Vernon. I teach in the, in the Department of English here. It's a pleasure for you all to, to be here with you all this evening. Um, and I want to thank the Hendricks Murphy Foundation and Hope and Henrietta and Sarah and, and the student workers, David and everybody. Thank you so much for making this event possible this evening. Vietnamese literature has arrived. Those born in Vietnam who came to the United States as children in the 1970s, some through Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, right up the road, those, in other words, who grew up immersed in the English language are now in their 40s and early 50s. They've achieved full artistic maturity. The first decade of the new millennium saw writers like novelist Monique Trung and memoirist Andrew Pham piling up accolades and awards. And quite recently, Vietnamese American writers have won the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for, fic for Fiction, the 2017 Yale Younger Poets Prize, and the 2018 T.S. Eliot Prize for Poetry. Our speaker tonight is part of this great wave. Gennaro Keeley Smith's first book, A Narrative in Verse, The Land Baron's Son, won the 2015 Indie Best, uh, Best Award for Be Book for Best Poetry. His second book, the novel The Land South of the Clouds, was a finalist for the 2016 Indie Award for Best Fiction. Smith was born in Nha Trang, Vietnam, which is on the coast, sort of northeast of Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City. The son of an American soldier and his Vietnamese wife, he lived in Vietnam for only three years before immigrating to the U.S. After growing up around Los Angeles, he moved to Louisiana in 1996 to pursue his MFA in creative writing under Robert Olin Butler at McNeese State. He's li lived in Louisiana ever since, now as a creative writing professor at Louisiana Tech. But his southerness isn't simply a matter of his um, circumstance of his teaching career. His father's family is from Louisiana, and his wife is from Jonesboro, Arkansas. Like Toni Morrison, Gennaro Smith writes books that explore our fraught relationship with our own histories. Set mostly in Vietnam, The Land Baron Son is fictional verse inspired by and centered on Smith's maternal grandfather, Le Liop, an aristocrat from South Vietnam who spent several brutal years after the war in a re-education camp. Set mostly in the, in the U.S., the sequel novel, The Land South of the Clouds, has a 10-year-old boy watching his mother yearn for the father she left behind even as he, her son, struggles to belong in America, not just a minority, but not even a full minority, neither fully black nor Vietnamese. As one reviewer has commented, The Land South of the Clouds is an angry book, justifiably so. There's a rawness to the emotions the characters experience and an aggression in the telling that is at times uncomfortable as it lays bare the racism that plagues society. Smith's book is direct and necessary, a wholly honest book about race in America. There's a fantastic scene towards the end of the novel, a kind of dream vision in which mother and son pull Lee Leop, the grandfather, out from a mailbox to bring him from Vietnam to California. With him comes the pouring waters of the Mekong Delta and the lush mountains of Vietnam's central highlands, but also all that damn rain, the heat, and humidity. Maybe if I should have left the weather behind, Lee Leop quips. But if I had, you would not get, the mount you'd not get mountains as green as these. It's not long before soldiers from the victorious North Vietnamese Army show up and begin rounding up the family's Los Angeles neighbors to send them to re-education camps, or worse. When you brought Vietnam, the mother says, you brought them also. Because you can't pick and choose from history. A legacy is a complete package. And when Lee Liop retreats to the mailbox, taking the mountains and Delta waters and weather and soldiers with him on their way back to Vietnam, he also takes his daughter, Vuan. As the narrator's grandfather and mother and the soldiers scurry through the mailbox, Francis Ford Coppola is there too, reprising his Apocalypse Now cameo. That's it, that's it, keep moving, but don't look at the camera. Then even Coppola, the man who claims he is Vietnam, passes through the mailbox. Outside this dream vision, in the real life of the novel, Vuan has returned to Vietnam, never to return to the U.S. to her son. History, yes. Race, yes. Survival, even. But Smith's stories are finally about what I guess most stories are about, which is love. They're about different kinds of love. They're about impediments to love. They're about possession and promise and use. They're sometimes about what we expect our partners and families to do for us, the unfair expectations, the undue burdens of our soul's needs. They are stories, finally, about yearning. Please join me in welcoming Gennaro Keeley Smith.
My gosh, thank you for that wonderful intro. It's like when he's retelling parts of uh, the title chapter, I thought, I thought to myself, yeah, I did write that part. <laughs> I did, I did. Um, there was a picture earlier, a photo earlier, of, of, of an old man, and that's Li Liao, my Vietnamese grandfather. He was a South Vietnamese uh, major. Um, and, but the interesting thing about him was that he had seven wives at the same time. And from those seven wives, and yes, they didn't know about each other. <laughs> and from those seven wives, he had 27 children. And my mother there is the 25th child out of the 27, and she's the only one who came to America. So I'm going to start with a piece called uh, View from the Veranda, an Elegy for Chan. And Chan was Lee Liop's butler and driver for many decades. Um, here we go. Okay. Saigon fell last week on a day too gray for April. Columns of black smoke pyre and spiral upward, informing heaven of our failure in keeping the kingdom intact. Saigon is still falling under the bludgeoning weight of fire, and mortar rounds divot the city's surface slow to scab and heal itself right again. The Viet Cong have begun the collection process going door to door to bind and parade prisoners through the streets before loading them into personnel carriers to be interrogated someplace else. Today, as with yesterday and the days before, Chan, my Chinese servant and driver of 40 years, stands beside me on the veranda, a white cloth draped over one poised arm, a decanter of sake in the other, as we watch the abortion before us, watch the Viet Cong erase the Caesarean line between North and South, and my daughter, Vu An, and her husband and son, safe within the womb of American democracy, comes to mind. I offered Chan the opportunity to leave with them, to allow cataracts to milk over till blind in the country, that surrendered on a piece of paper and made sure to drown their helicopters in the Gulf before leaving. But he refused, saying, this is my home. I continue to stare out over Saigon while my seven wives and our remaining 20 children are still asleep in sheets they will learn to launder for themselves. And I am pleased they are not awake to see this. But how they can sleep through the screams that siren the city, or even worse, those same screams ceasing suddenly escapes me. The bottom part of the sky grows dense and dark like hell has latched onto heaven's hem. Sometime tomorrow, Chan will rise before sunup, dressed in his white Nehru jacket, buttoned to the collar. His white slacks crease thin as documents. He will make sure his loafers have a sheen that absorbs sunlight before making the drive into the city and park the Citroen outside Ben Tan Market. Enter and select from buckets of freshly cut carnations, a, a different color per wife. Pick through the pyramidal displays of pears and apples and mangoes, purple dragon fruits with gnarled pointed scales, bunches of longans and lychees. Then make his way to the beds of shaved ice to choose salt preserved mackerels, catfish and tuna, some as big as small children. As with the past 40 years, he will bypass the young female vendors who plead too much, whose fish are not as uniformly displayed on ice loosely packed, and buy from the old woman that has always been honest, even admitting her catches were not from that morning. Chan will secure a bottle of sake. He will inventory his basket, discover he has forgotten the incense sticks for my dead ancestors, purchase plenty for the week, and then walk past the female vendors who squint, and even turn away when he steps outside into the white light. And so Chan was executed, because um, they wanted to rid uh, Vietnam of all the foreigners, and he would not leave, and so that was his fate. Um, because my grandfather's involvement with the South Vietnamese Army who were allies with the Americans, he was rounded up and placed in a re-education camp to, to set their minds right. 
Okay, so this next poem I'm going to read is called um, Our Daily Bread, and it's about his first week in a re-education camp. Are you guys doing okay? You, you guys fine? You, got, you have such a beautiful campus. Uh, it, it's, it's unbelievable. It makes me want to teach here, you know? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I saw that, Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. Our daily bread. It's the same rhetoric every morning. Wake before the sun, clothe ourselves, file outside before our barracks, and listen to the trees instruct us on how to be Uncle Ho's children. That our minds are not our own, but Vietnam's. And we must show our cause by taking up the sickles and hoes and march into the fields. I remember my first morning waking up in the cooperatives, thanking God who called us from the trees, spoke Vietnamese, and that his son spoke it too, not Aramaic, not Hebrew, nor Latin, or even French. That first day working 16 hours in the fields made me feel like one of his banished sons, for the air were hands that held us under, and we had to rear our heads and shoulders in protest of his callous palms as we slew stalks from the earth rolled them into bundles to rend grains free from their sheaths against bamboo mats and collected his bountiful harvest with our small hands. He moved us like oxen, and his invisible yoke, heavy on our shoulders, yanked us up by our frayed collars whenever we staggered or fell to our knees. Still, his voice broadcasted from the trees, discouraging us from the weight of thinking I thought of the guards that day not as brothers, as they insisted we called them, and not as Uncle Ho's children, but God's ordained bishops and cardinals and appointed popes brandishing Russian AK-47s and M-16s that had, they had pilfered from dead GIs, leaving them unarmed and defenseless in the afterlife, drilling catechism to the back of our heads whenever we backslide or they marked our bodies with a number of rosaries for sins to be forgiven. At the end of the day, they always remembered the addle-minded, the weak who failed to harness and shoulder their load, the ones who wilted brown beneath the sun. They always remembered those whose tongues betrayed them and graced the gliding syllables of French or the abrupt stops required of English or hummed hymns to Christ. They were the ones whose names were called from his roll book to be summoned forth from the barracks before mealtime and escorted by minions to be sacrificed in the fields. And we thank God for having called the others before us, those whose offerings proved to be as insufficient as Cain's. We thank God their blood would suffice for the, for the time being. And I recall that first day they let us sit a spell in the shade recall my back against one of the trunks, and I felt a wire vine its way up the tree to a set of speakers nestled among the coconuts. During our respite, we continued to hear him, the rise and fall, the weighted stress on certain syllables that lulled our hearts in breathing to a calm. That calm was not there after the names had stopped being called. After the fields crackled with gunshot, we were allowed to eat and sleep. And that first night when I laid my head to rest, I knew that come next day, in order to silence the summoning of names to be sacrificed in the fields, I was going to take my sickle and sever God's vocal cords. Yeah. Now, in the first poem I read, a View from the Veranda, Lee Liop was thinking about his daughter, uh, the, the, the one who came to, to um, America. And then and, and those are the three people in the novel, which is a companion piece to The Lamb Baron's Son, so I'm going to read chapter one. Okay. <clears throat> That's me in, in plaid. Uh, <laughs> I was stylish even back then. The ladies knew where it was at. It was right here. Okay, all right. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> this is so bad. 
Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> this is called Asia Minor, Los Angeles, 1979, June. I am 10 when mother teaches me to lie. For the past couple of weeks, mother told me to tell anyone who calls, except for Aunt Pham Phi and her family, that she doesn't live here anymore. You can even tell them I'm dead, she said. One evening while I watched her pack pantaloons, capri pants, and old yaj she had not worn since the day she came to America. She went through and emptied dresser drawers and shoe boxes, kept the top closet shelves for Polaroids of family picnics at Griffith Park, and jade figurines to fill the large black Samsonite suitcase she had lying open on the bed. Between the long-sleeved white gowns, she tucked away a bundle of her father's letters she had saved over the years, letters with blue stripes lining the edges, and stamps of tanks and the wavering red communist flag still intact. Yes, she nodded as she closed the suitcase and snapped shut the locks. Tell them I'm dead. Tell them anything you want to. Now, she set the Samsonite on the floor. Put this in your room, somewhere where I can find it. I haven't told anyone yet, but now that she is waiting out on the front patio for a taxi to take her to the airport, everything from car accidents to cancer to murder crosses my mind. From the front door, I practice the lies I will tell people while watching Mother as she stands between the potted my trees. Every inch of their branches is covered with tiny yellow blossomed flowers. Beside her is a Samsonite with the red, white, and blue tag tied to the handle. She is on her way to the airport to board a plane for Vietnam, and all I can do is stand here. I can't even bring myself to wake up Dad, who'd probably stare at me through half-shut eyes, mumble something I can't understand, and throw the covers over his head because it is his only day off. Besides, I promised Mother I wouldn't say anything until after she leaves or until Dad wakes up. She died of cancer, I whisper, though I don't know what it means, even after I had asked Mother a couple days ago. She told me it was something small and black, and it lived inside of us and grew. And as it grows, she said, it eats you up inside till there is nothing left of you. The sun has already risen, and from our home atop a hill overlooking downtown Los Angeles, the black and silver skyscrapers look small. Mother turns her head to the side, and I get a glimpse of her profile before she faces downtown, which is barely aroused with traffic. Earlier, I had tried calling her several times, but she wouldn't answer me or even tell me to go back inside. So I stare at her long black hair uncut since the day she was born. It hangs straight down her back just below the waist. She died in a car accident, I say. This time she doesn't turn her head. She remains still with arms crossed in front of her. Whatever excuse I practice doesn't fit. And whenever I come up with the truth, I think for one moment it sounds better. But what do I tell them when they ask why? She doesn't live here anymore, I say. And when I open my mouth to explain, nothing comes out. Mother begins humming quietly to herself and then stops. When she starts up again, she goes into a song she used to sing back home in Vin Long or Play Coup or Saigon or wherever Dad was stationed at the time. She stretches and turns words in her throat until she shapes the right sounds, then releases them. Her voice grows louder, and I keep looking behind me for Dad. Still, her voice rises, extending vowels into the next word so that I can't hear where one word ends and the other begins. Just to make sure Dad doesn't wake up, I go back inside the house, through the living room, and stand in the hallway. From the hallway, I can still watch Mother while keeping an eye out for Dad. The door to the bedroom is partly opened, and Dad's snoring fills the room. Only when he breathes out in broken whistles can I hear Mother singing. I want to go back to the front door. Instead, I stay where I am between them, listening to their sounds and how they don't go together, one sound drowning out the other. Mother sings louder, and her body begins to sway from her efforts so much so that she begins to bend her knees. 
When she straightens up, she has a suitcase in her hand, but continues singing as she comes away from the patio and stands at the steps. I assume the taxi has just pulled up along the curb. Mother steps down and nearly falls over from the weight of the suitcase. Before taking another step, she holds the handle with both hands and leans to one side for balance. Her thick-soled sandals and ankles disappear. Then her knees and thighs in a suitcase, and from the waist up, there is only her long hair. The way she leans to one side seems like she is fighting whatever is pulling her down. Her shoulders and head stay afloat for a moment before the right shoulder dips from view, and then she is gone. I run to the front door and stop. I can't see the taxi down below because of the second level patios on both sides of the steps. Only the rooftops of homes across the unseen street in downtown LA. I do not even yell out goodbye. She never turned around to say anything. She keeps singing. I turned to scream for dad, but I promised her. Afraid to miss even the sound of her taxi leaving, I stay by the door and continue to ball up my pajama pants. And then I hear it. The taxi pulls away from the curb and halts at the corner stop sign before taking off down Montana Avenue, and I want to go after her. I think that if I am fast enough and rely on the hill to carry me down, I can catch her at the light. But I am afraid she may see me in the rearview mirror when she, see, when she sits forward in her seat to talk to the driver. I am afraid of seeing the taxi pull farther away. She is dead, I say. How? Something black ate her up from the inside. I don't know. She's dead. Mother is on her way to the airport, and I wonder if I will ever hear from her or if dad will go after her, but I doubt that he will ever speak her name again. I go back inside and walk through the living room until I am in the hallway. The door is still partially opened, and dad's snoring sounds louder now that mother is gone. I never doubted mother when she said she was leaving, but I didn't think it would be this soon. I walk down the hallway to the bedroom and look inside. Though the curtains are drawn, the room is still sunny, and dad is underneath the white comforters, which rise and fall. His big black feet hang over the edge of the bed, and his legs are tangled up in the sheet. I open the door just a little, and it creaks, and I am ready to jump back in case he wakes up. But his snoring hasn't changed, and I stand there for a moment before poking my head inside. Dad, I say. The comforters rise and fall. Dad, I whisper harshly. Dad, I say a little louder. I open the door a little wider and step inside the bedroom to make my way to Dad. Before I'm even there, someone from behind me says, get out of there, Long Van. I jump, and in turning around to look behind me, I hit the door with my arm. Mother is at the end of the hallway. I stutter, wanting to tell her that it's not what it looks like, but she knows that I'm not good at lying. I look at dad beneath all the covers. I make my way down the hallway to mother, and as she waits, my ears burn, my legs become wobbly, and I can hardly breathe. I stand in front of her, and she stares right at me, and I have to open my mouth to breathe. Her small lips are pressed together, and it doesn't seem like she is going to speak. I, 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 I say, pointing my thumb over my shoulder. Mother points a finger at me and says, don't tell your dad. She punctuates each word with a jab of her finger. Yes, but I, 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 I turn halfway around to face their bedroom with my thumb pointed. I mean anyone, she continues jabbing. You hear me? I nod. She lowers her hand, taps the suitcase and says, now keep this in your room somewhere where I can find it. Okay, and, 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 and you guys are okay? You, you, seriously? Okay, all right. So I'm going to end by reading uh, a couple of poems from the first book. And the thing is, um, when my grandfather was placed in a re-education camp, the seven wives didn't know their fate, what would happen. My grandfather uh, was the son of a land baron, and they, he, he inherited a lot of land. Okay? He was a rich man, very rich. He had seven houses, seven wives. He even had mistresses per wife. And it drains me just to think about 
dealing with all those women. I, I've got a, a wife, just one, two daughters. <sighs> now you know why I asked if there was any wine, all right? Okay, all right. All right, so I'm going to read two poems from a section called what and what of my wives and daughter. And some of the wives had to like marry other guys in order to survive. Okay. And this one is called a museum of trees. And this is Viet, the Wednesday wife. All right? I, I gave each wife a day of the week so that I could keep them in mind, right? So Viet marries a, 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 a painter for a husband. And the interesting thing is Viet means poet or artist. Okay, so it's befitting that she marries this painter. A museum of trees. He will not say where he gets his tubes of paint or the canvases he stretches taut to nail to wooden frames. I do not want to think of how he acquires them what part of himself he must give up for ruining. For I know he does not have the money, only the allotment the government gives us, 100,000 doms a month. He spends the day on hand and knees, a three-legged easel, combining colors he keeps beneath the loose floorboard in case of inspections, in case of neighbors wanting rewards. Like the easel we offered to a neighbor to keep ourselves out of the re-education camp when he walked by. Our door opened long enough for him to glimpse inside. The neighbor probably exchanged it for coffee beans he would have to grind himself, cigarettes he would have to hand roll. Perhaps he handed it over to a fisherman in return for a basket full of smelt, or one long, large milkfish he'd have to heft over one shoulder, down street after street before realizing a starving country would not let him make it home. Trang paints pictures of children holding cane poles, their lines mirrored on the water's surface. A boatman oaring the Mekong, farmers working striated mountains or doubled over in rice fields, their faces hidden from the shadows of their sun hats, mother with child, men at card tables, their cigarette smoke creating clouds. Monks swathed in saffron robes, bowing before an altar, shoulder-exposed women with downcast eyes, and even a lone fisherman using an easel as an improvised divinity rod to navigate his way through the thousands of rocks in Halong Bay to set his nets and lines and hooks in hopes of finding abundance that would forever feed him. When done, Trang fashions wires to the frames, and at night when everyone is asleep, when the lanterns have all been extinguished, we go out into the neighborhood and climb high into the Mai trees and bait his paintings from their thin branches to lure passers-by. He and I know they are there, hidden during the day when the tight-fisted buds are afire in full yellow blooms. And at night they close their fingers to expose the paintings, but no one looks up anymore. Okay, and the last one, I think I'm okay with time. I could do one more maybe and then take some questions afterwards. Okay. This, this one's called The Fisherman's Wife. And this is my, who is the Monday wife, okay? I know, I know. I know. Oh, man. Uh, Yen's my favorite wife. Uh, yeah, she's the young one, you yeah. um, The Fisherman's Wife. I am given to a fisherman who sets sail just as the night begins to pale and invite morning, and he, and he returns when the night is the same shade. Each night I try to distinguish the glow of his lanterns, the true light of my new husband among the hundreds who come in from the South China Sea. But I am unable to tell him apart from the others. While away, we wives work the prior day's catches, slicing them down their middles to extract their innards, then pack the insides with rock salt imported from Honkai, the land of acrid columns God created and cast from heaven 
to help preserve what we took from his oceans. Some fish are as big as wives, bigger than men even, and with these we make sure she saw blood we we make sure the saw blades are sharp enough to penetrate their thick skin, their scales larger than thumbnails. I never speak of Lee Leoptitran, speak of how our first husband kept his hands clean, even manicured by one of his mistresses before touching his wives. I try not to cringe in his handling of me every night when we are alone, this boy of 17 who looks like a man aged by the seagulls in salt air, the casting and hauling in of nets, the securing of catches, and the long lonely hours left to wander and dream on the water, or what he will say other than three word sentences. When we kiss, I breathe into him each year the ocean is old, and his grip is tight around my hips, tighter still when he clasps my wrist over my head like he is working the knots out of nets, made tangled by the thrashing of a catch he needs to subdue, a catch he does not want to let go. Okay, and, and, I, and I think that's it for, for the ring. Did I read enough? I, I, I never know about these things. Uh. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, you, you always have like the minutes in your you know, recorded in your books. It was was that good enough for you? It was long enough? Okay, all right, okay. I, I guess I'll take some questions now. Uh, anything you guys want to know or or anything at all? Don't be shy. <laughs> I'll, I'll take any questions. <laughs> Trust me. Okay. See, I can't even see. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how do you describe um, your process for writing poetry versus narrative work? Well, primarily I'm a, I'm a fiction writer. Now, when I learned about uh, prose poetry, I thought, uh, uh, this is great. It's kind of like cheap, you know? So it's <laughs> like prose poetry. Prose poetry is like the, the shortest smart, uh, short story as possible. You know, uh, the thing with uh, the poems that I read is, or that I wrote is that I, I want you to get to the end of the poem and not feel like you're lost. And so that, that's the fiction writer working when I do poetry. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> right, yeah. uh, anybody else? Anyone else? Yes, young lady. Okay, like in the first chapter that I, that I wrote where, you know, the mother's packing up her suitcase, all the items are true, you know. Her packing a suitcase is fictional. She, 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 she never, in real life, she never left. Um, um, but she did say, if anyone calls, tell, tell people I'm dead. She, she did say that, that, that's true. And here's the reason why. It was back in the 70s, she didn't know that you can't pretend you're dead. <laughs> because my father was so bad with, with, with credit, you know, so we had these calls coming in all the time, and, and my, it just drained my mother's, you know, psyche, you know, to, to have to answer the phone. Because back in the 70s, you didn't have a voicemail. You didn't have a, an answering machine. It's, it's, you have to be there to answer the phone. You have to be present. So, so she would tell me, I'm like six or seven years old, and I, if it's not something we know, just tell them I'm dead. <laughs> so I used that for, for the opening yeah, uh, of the chapter. But as a kid growing up, she would get all these letters and she would read about how horrible the conditions were. Mm -hmm. Lee Leon, like I said, was a very rich man. So to have him write letters asking for money, medicine, and clothes, that was what he was reduced to. You know, a guy who had seven houses, uh, you know, and he can't even afford to eat, you know. Um, so yeah, you, you, there's a balance between fiction and, and truth, and the idea is, and I learned this from John Wood, uh, the famous poet from McNeese, he said, you know, with fiction or poetry, you have to lie and lie and lie and lie until 
there's some semblance of a truth that comes forth. And, 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 and I was telling someone, I, I think she's here. Um, I forget her, her last name. Oh, she, she, she used to do swim meets in Shreveport. That's you. There you go. Yeah. Madeline? Is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, the, the, the idea is, is, is you have to make it believable on a page. And I, I told her that there was like a, a, a chapter where, where people would call me up or text me or, or send me emails and say, you know, how true is this chapter? The, the chapter, beautiful, and the next chapter, how is not important, were together, went, went, you know, consecutive order. Apparently, it was so believable that my aunt called me up and said, did you marry a Vietnamese woman? And it's like, I, I, I've never married anyone else but Robin. <laughs> You're a niece. <laughs> you know, so, so, so whenever you have people believing that everything is true on the page, then you've done your job. And, and that's the goal, you know. I would send you know, rough drafts of short stories or, or parts of the novels to a friend of mine, Neil Connolly, excellent, great novelist. And he said that he, keep, he keeps forgetting that I'm half Vietnamese but half black. That when he reads my stuff, he thinks I, I was like a pure-blooded Vietnamese person. And so I have, that, that's the selling point. Is I've got to sell it to all of you that I know my culture, but I don't. But I've got to <laughs> take it. You know, I've got to take it. All right. Okay. Anybody else? Any, anyone? Yeah, Jacob. Um, so, uh, in the novel, uh, I'm sorry, in, in the book of poetry, you're writing uh, from the point of view of your grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, earlier in the session, when we were reading um, Andrew X. Long's book, uh, yeah. you had an, uh, where he's writing from the poetry perspective. Mm -hmm. um, when writing from the perspective of a family, Mm -hmm. um, how do you sort of uh, negotiate the space between like, reality and fiction? And, like, why, and also, why, uh, why do you choose to the uh, space of that? Oh, well, it, it, it's it, 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 the challenge, first and foremost. And, you know, can, can I get away with doing it? Um, like in the section of the poetry book, I, I write from the persona of each one. Yeah. And I, I just love the challenge, um, and, and, and I, I hope I'm not doing them a disservice when I write from their perspective, but so far, so good, you know? I, so far, my, my, my mom's not angry at me. <laughs> so, so that's good. She, she's more in line with, well, will Hollywood pick up the book? You know, will they pick up the book? You know that's her mentality. It's like, no, 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 maybe, maybe not, but, you know. So she, but I mean, I, I just love the challenge, and, and, and it's, it's, it's rewarding when it, it comes off as their voice, you know, uh, I just love it. Anyone else? Oh, yes, go ahead. Two questions? Oh, oh my gosh, I don't know. Okay, but well, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, here's the thing. My father was a cook for the Air Force. He wanted to be a pilot, but he scored too low on the aptitude test. He knew that he was going to get drafted and be a foot soldier. So he did a preemptive strike on the military by enlisting as a cook. He did have to return fire every once in a while, you know. So, so. But the thing is, during his spare time, he, he had nothing to do. So he decided to teach uh, uh, English to my mother, who, who, whose name is Meow Feely. And so imagine this, this black guy from New Orleans is, is, is teaching English to a woman whose father is, is a land baron, basically. And he's like royalty, you know. And he steals her heart, you know. They, they went on secret dates because they couldn't date because of uh, the race issue. Twelve weeks after their first English lesson, they eloped, okay? And, and, and they tell me they eloped because it's the war. 
we all know if we're gonna live through this or not. So, so, so they got married, right? Okay. Legally, I disowned her for marrying my father. So for a year, he had nothing to do with her. However, there's a section of the, the, the base where the married people live on, in certain barracks. She would step outside of her door and find baskets full of like fruits and vegetables and like an occasional fish. <laughs> a live chicken that she would have to like wring its neck and stuff like that. And she had no clue who was sending these baskets, right? It was Chan. Chan was delivered uh, uh, from my grandfather's order. He, yeah, Chan delivered these baskets. He wouldn't talk to my mother, but, but he, he, he still wanted to let her know that he's thinking about her. Okay? So, so when I was born, okay, Lee Leon was curious, like, you know, what the heck does a black man and a Vietnamese woman, what do they produce? Right? <laughs> so, so he sends Chan to send a word of note to, to my mom and said, you know, I'd like to meet this kid you have. Yeah. So he, he comes by the, the base, sees me, and he sees, like, my features in him, and he accepted my mom back into the family again and, and, and said, you're my son-in-law, you come live in my house. So, so it took the birth of me <laughs> to race together. Makes me feel like Obama. <laughs> the, the one, right? That's, that's what his name means. The one, right? I'm that guy. <laughs> now, now, what is your second? Uh, No, 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 I'm a mama's boy. I, 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 I'm not afraid to admit that. Uh, the, the thing is, growing up, I, I, I stuck to my mom a lot because of the, she was still learning English, you know, and so I was helping her learn English. She left her father, her, her 26 other half-brothers and sisters, her aunts and uncles, her whole country to be alone in America, basically. And so I saw that as a kid, and I just gravitated more towards my, my mom. Also because my dad was always critical of me. You know, every, everything out of his mouth was always a criticism of, of anything I did. You know? so, and, 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 um, and so I wanted to be that, that missing part in my mother's life. All of Vietnam is missing in her life in America, so I wanted to fill in that gap, and that's why the relationship between a mother and Long Van is, is pretty intense, like you said, you know. Um, you know, the whole novel is more like an homage to my mother and, and what she's had to endure while, while being in America. So, okay. Anyone else? Anyone? Did, did I answer your question? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew I was a mama's boy. What? When I went to grad school, right, in McNeese, I left Los Angeles, went to McNeese, and it was getting towards winter, you know, and I figured, ah, oh, I need a, like, a, like a comforter, you know, during the wintertime. And I was looking at comforters, you know, instead of like the bold male colors, I'm looking at comforters with like flowers on them. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know it's like, oh, that's my mother, you know, in my head, you know, so, yeah. Elizabeth, you doing okay? You hanging in there? Uh, okay. Alright, okay. Any other questions? Uh, anything else? Jordan, go ahead. Um, how did you find a relationship around I think changing the process? Oh, oh, man. I, don't take this the wrong way, Jordan. Alright? But, but I like writing about my Asian roots, okay? Vietnamese roots. I've been criticized by black communities because I don't write enough about black characters black people. And the reason is because I identify more with my mom's side. You know, like I, like I said, it, it's, you know, she's, she's basically abandoned in America with no other, she never went back. She never went back. I did. And, um, but, but I like being able to 
jump from one race to the next and, and write from different points of view. Um, even running from a woman's point of view as well. Um, so I have no problem with that. Um, but, but, but yeah, I, 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 it goes through stages throughout life, but I've always maintained a happier medium during Vietnamese stories, you know. <laughs> and, and it sounds pompous, and it is pompous, but, but I want to be that guy that, that people think about when they think about Vietnam literature. You know, I, I want my name to come up. And the thing also is, there are many African American people in the American black literature canon, and they've handled it better than whatever I can do, you know. So I want to create that Asian canon for, you know, Vietnam in America, okay? Any other ones? Anything else? Oh, yes. Did I meet you this morning? Yeah. Okay. What, 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 what? In the Murphy Brown? Yeah. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Now, what is your name? Rashani. Okay, okay, go ahead. Um, I just had a question about uh, the religious imagery in the land of Aaron's son. I mm -hmm. find it pretty fascinating how um, uh, you, you use like capital H in different places, religion has a very conspicuous recurring theme. I guess it, it, it is a recurring theme throughout mm -hmm. the text. Um, also, kind of how uh, the role of God plays. Um, we talked a little bit in class about how it's both kind of submissive and obedient, mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than religion being as a place of uh, hope and um, yeah. sort of sanctuary. And yeah. so, I just want since it's uh, so conspicuous throughout the text, I, I just wanted to hear kind of what um, what role does religion play? Yeah, I, I, the thing is, before the fall of Saigon. <clears throat> The idea is that my grandfather and his wives and his, uh, you know, children live this this prosperous, almost heavenly life, you know. Uh, but, but but it's a life they took for granted, and when all of that was stripped away, it's like they turned their backs on the God that served them well all those years. Um, and it's like, it's like God is recouping all that you've taken from me. And so I'm going to give you an, an alternate version of heaven, which is not going to be likable. You know? So you have like one wife who works in the salt mines and she is raped. You know? um, one wife who becomes a prostitute, which is like a wife she's never, ever, you know, even thought of doing. So, so I wanted to, to, to make the heaven on earth become this living hell for them, you know, and to be bitter against God. And it's something I teach in Southern uh, lit courses at Tech. The idea that, um, you know, you, you either embrace God during the hard times or you turn your back on him. Yeah. Or the third option is, I still believe in you, but why? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I answered your question. I think. I'm, okay. You, you, you sure? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I never know. <laughs> I never know. Oh, there's there's Nicole. Yeah. That, that's fine. Yeah. I admitted in the workshop that I wanted her to do a power drive on me because I watched WWE wrestling. You know what? I don't want to think. She looks like one of the football wrestlers. Uh, just the <laughs> Concuss me all you want, right? Okay. Any other questions? One more question. What, one more? I have a beautiful wife. <laughs> Two beautiful girls. And they have, and my wife is envious because they have the Asian features, are our daughters. And so, so that, that's the envious part of my wife is like, I wish they, I could have those features as well. Yeah, so, so, so yes, yeah, so, oh, uh, uh, two more, go ahead. You can go ahead first. Um, can you tell us a little more about your Louisiana roots? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, oh, man, my, my father, uh, you know, when, when he brought us over to America, we settled in New Orleans where he grew up. And we stayed there for two months, and he knew that he didn't want to raise 
two sons in, in, in New Orleans, so he moved us to Los Angeles. Okay, and the thing is, my, my father came from such a broken home where uh, um, you had eight kids from four different fathers. And my grandmother never married a single one of those four. And he didn't want us to be exposed to that sort of environment, so that's why he went to Los Angeles, where they, they still live since 1972. Okay. And, and, you know, you, you get Jordan, you get to be at a certain age where you want to get in touch with your southern roots or whatever, wherever you're from, and so that's why I applied to McNeese State University in Lake Charles, Louisiana. That would bring me close to my family members in New Orleans. Um, and I wanted to know my southern roots. And, uh, and I've been in Louisiana since 96. I haven't gone back, you know. And I don't plan to. Who we visit, you know, go to Disneyland, <laughs> go, go to Venice Beach, you know, you see, see like uh, the basketball players cuss each other out, you know, on that famous basketball court in Venice, you know, the one that was featured in American History X, remember that scene, remember that? Oh my, great movie. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, yes, young lady, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it's great, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Stop there. laughs> 